Good evening. My name is Brian Driscoll, the Technical Assistance Coordinator with the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. When I was finishing up some classes in grad school, I came across this medical journal that had a, um, like a case study of lead poisoning in a renovated farmhouse. And <clears throat> it kind of brought home all of these things we hear about, about um, the dangers of lead. Because this is a real case study. This is something that really happened. And in reading through that study, they don't use names, of course, but it kind of it brought, it explained some of the things that happened to this family and their household and their pets. And it kind of makes it real. <clears throat> As a way of pointing out that if you have a home that was built before the 1940s, chances are you're going to have lead paint. Well, chances are unless it's been, unless it's been removed, you probably will have that. Um, they, they stopped, from what I understand, they stopped using it in 19, 1978. So even a house before 1978 might, might find lead paint in it. They used it, it was much more prevalent before the 40s. After the 40s, they started phasing it out a little bit. By the, by the late 70s, they said, this is enough, we're not going to use this anymore. Lead's like really good stuff when it comes to paint. Because it holds up well, it resists moisture well, it helps with the colors. Um, <clears throat> it helps, it's very opaque, you can put a thin coat on and it can cover things. But unfortunately, it's, you know, poisonous. So, <laughs> I guess we won't do that anymore. <clears throat> but, you really do need to be careful if you're working on painted mm, wood surfaces, or any surfaces for that matter. Um, if, if, you, if you don't know whether or not it has lead, just assume that it does, and go ahead and take those precautions. And the biggest problem with lead paint, in windows especially, is um, are the areas where you get some abrasion, where something's rubbing up against something else. And, and you're rubbing some of that paint off a little bit at a time, and you get lead dust down in the sill, and that can be transferred from hand to mouth. That's a big problem. Um, if you're actually, you don't want to dry sand, lead paint, you're creating all this dust. Dust is bad stuff. Lead dust is bad stuff. The other thing you really don't want to do, and I have this picture in my head of the guy who ran the cabinet shop where I worked, and his, his wife was out no, she was actually in the, in the living room, stripping um, the fireplace mantle with her infant right here. And she was using a torch. <clears throat> now, a torch is way too hot, and what it does is it turns that lead into vapors. And they're easily inhaled, and they go right into your bloodstream. It's like one of the worst ways to do this. And when lo looking back on that picture in my head, I'm going, oh my gosh, I wish I had known this. I would have said something. So I just, I just want to say, there, there's a lot of angst about lead paint and we need to remove it all and <clears throat> all of this stuff. It's okay if it's on there and it's, and it's sound, it's not peeling, it's, you don't have dust. You gotta be careful where abrasion and, and lead dust. But other than that, um, I mean, it's okay if you encapsulate it. I'm, I'm sure we have lead paint all, all around this room. It's not like radioactivity. You just have to be aware of it and take some precautions when you're working on it. Okay? And I think uh, you can find a lot of information about working on older homes and lead paint problems online, I'm sure. Um, okay, so with that little caveat out of the way, I want to I do a... One of the things I have in the handout is a, is a sketch. Someone did a sketch for the Old House Journal. This is one of the best things I've seen. It, it just shows you all the parts of a wood window, what they're called. It doesn't really tell you what they do, but it's, it's a nice kind of orthographic sketch. It shows you three-dimensional, and it has some cutaway areas that show you where the weight pockets are and what, how all this is put together. It kind of takes the mystery out of some of these things. I mean, <clears throat> this is a wood window frame. You, 
could build one of these, okay? You could build one of these in like in your backyard. If you look at it, it's just made up of common components cut to certain sizes and assembled together. It's not that hard. Um, it kind of reminds me of, I had a 64 Plymouth and I used to replace the, they used to say plugs, points, and condensers. I could replace the plugs and points and condensers. Slant six? It was a flat, yeah, I think. No, it was a 383. <laughs> It was a great class. Go ahead. Um, we can't do that anymore because now everything is electronic ignition. You got to bring it, you gotta plug it in. This is kind of the '64 Plymouth of Windows. Okay, it's, you can work on these things yourselves, and I think that's one of the that's one of the advantages actually of having these as opposed to replacement windows. You can fix these. They're made of wood. Had some wood skills, some basic wood skills. You can repair these. That's one of the best things about it. You have a vinyl window, and something breaks. A little piece, a little um, elastic string or something, or the springs get wonky. You go back to the manufacturer. Oh, we don't make that model anymore. Or the manufacturer is gone. Yeah, or they you can't find them. <clears throat> these things are fixable. If, if they're still making the units, you can identify from the model or the size. They might be able to, if it's a problem with the sash, they might be able to replace the sash. But a lot of times, if you can't find the manufacturer, and you can't find that little part that, that something happened to, then you're dealing with, you know, then what do I do? You can't make something, well, sometimes you can, I suppose. But no, you can't repair vinyl, that's for sure. And oftentimes you can't find these little components because they don't no longer make that model or something like that. I've also included in here what it says, a short primer on glazing your windows. Probably the most common maintenance procedure you're going to do on your windows is replacing the glazing compound after it wears out. Because it does wear out. It was kind of made to wear out, like, like brickboard was made to wear out. <clears throat> Um, I found that pretty useful. Again, taking kind of the mystery out of all of this stuff. Um, so, I was thinking about, okay, you live in this old house, you have these old wood windows, why shouldn't I just replace these? You know, it makes some nice windows, they look pretty good. And I got to going kind of down a list in my head of why you shouldn't do that. And I think the, the most important one for me, with the training in history, is they're authentic. It's the authenticity of them. It's the fact that these were made 100 years ago, 120 years ago. You cannot replace <clears throat> those characteristics that that, that that component has. I mean, as I was in here looking at some of these door jams. Um, and it's obvious that people moved furniture in and out and in and out of these rooms for how long? And you can see evidence of that on that door jam. And that's the kind of thing that you are not going to duplicate in a replacement window. They are original to the house. And I think that's really, really important. You know, there are aesthetic concerns about true divided lights like we have here. Instead of having a kind of a flat grill, you've got this depth going on that creates shadows, creates interest. If you're into that kind of thing, it, it's an aesthetic concern. When you look at it, it's visually interesting, okay? That's important too, I think. Especially if, if it conveys, um, what was that word, the historic, historicity, the historicity <laughs> of, a, of a house. Any questions? I have window prizes, remember? <laughs> Brian, what's the, how can windows make or break uh, a house for, for uh, uh, or, or probably for a National Register nomination? A National Register nomination? Well, that's kind of its own little critter. <clears throat> uh, of course, what we advocate is the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which says 
If you can repair them, repair them. If, if they're too far gone to repair, which is kind of a subjective thing, um, replace them with something that matches the, the materials and, and the configuration. You're going to match what you're replacing. Um, I'm sorry. What was your question? <laughs> just what? Just how can just how can a replacement window break or or, oh, okay. or, or not yes. make sure? National Register. Your house can remain on the National Register if your windows are replaced. I mean, that's just a fact. If they're replaced with windows that convey visually those details of whatever it is that you're replacing. So if you go back to the replacement window, it's made of wood, it has divided lights, um, your house can still remain on the National Register. But if it was a final replacement window, that would... Well, Sometimes what happens is you get windows that are made in standard sizes and your home isn't necessarily a standard size. Mm -hmm. So you kind of buy the size that's the next smallest down and you fill in around the edges or something like that. If, if the opening is, is shortened, um, if we have six over six to true divided lights like this and they get replaced with two, over two, which is a whole different time period, then you might have issues with that, or one of the ones, or, or the, the cute little old English triangular ones, or something like that, that you know, just convey a false sense of history in that, in that case. Um, so, yes? Yes. Uh, yes? On the secretary standards, mm -hmm. uh, is there a preference towards if a, if a window has to be is teetering between repair and replace. Is there a preference towards repair but not operable versus replace with a new, you know, wood window that would be oper operable? Okay, so you say so you have casement windows mm -hmm. that are really bad shape. You can fix them, but to make them operational would be cost prohibitive, maybe or something. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason. So let's cock them shut. Mm -hmm. Is that a, is there a preference or? I mean, as far as the National Register and our office is concerned, it's not really a preference. I mean, the fact that you're <clears throat> retaining them, I think, is the most important part in repairing them. The only the only thing I would say is that there again, the Secretary of the Interior Standards says whatever we're doing to this, we ought to be able to reverse. So can someone come along later and put the hinges on and take all that caulking off and make it operable? I, I, I would say be careful of, of that. Are we making a permanent change or is it something that someone can undo in the future? So that would be a consideration. But yes, we repaired them, that's great, but we don't really want to go that step further and make them operable. Okay, the repair does not necessarily have to be uh, to the extent that it that would allow the window to be truly operational, it's just repair for preservation. Yes. For example, in a double hung window, would you have to uh, have the upper part, upper part, and the ropes and the counterweights and everything you know operational? I'm willing, to bet, I'm willing to bet that window's not operational. No, I mean it's not even part of the application whether your windows are functional. I think all of these windows are pretty much covered. Okay, let's see. Some of the other reasons why you shouldn't replace them, I think one would be materials. We're working with, oftentimes, almost all the time, old growth wood, which is much denser, comes out of a, the hardwood of the tree, um, it's, it holds up to um, moisture and weather and even insects much better than this faster growing timber that's being used today. Um, it's just a better material that is very, very difficult to find these days. So if you're looking at replacing pieces, um, you really do want to try to find older lumber to make new pieces from because it, it's just going to hold up better because it's old growth wood. 
and the rings are closer together and the wood is more dense and it's going to hold up better in the long run. Um, I've seen that a lot with new pine that starts to deteriorate very quickly if left um, uncoated out in the weather. Any questions? I, I have window prizes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm going down my list of repairable. Like I said, if you look at the sketch of the window, it's, it's really just a group of components that are attached together. And if you come up and look at this frame, it's really what it is. This is one piece of wood. It's screwed together on the side, which is what, the way they always did it, but this particular one is. This is a separate piece of wood. It's just essentially a board. It's got a little groove cut in it. And then they put this other little piece in here that will separate the two sash. You can make this on a table saw. Right here. You can, you can remake this easily. It's not that complicated. And that's what I like about it. Um, there are no special parts, really. Like I was talking about with some of the replacement units, if, if a, a little specialty part breaks or something happens to it and you can't find another one, then what do you do? Well, oftentimes, you, you can still find parts for these. You can find pulleys, you can find weights, you can find um, uh, the poles, or whatever, you know, whatever kind of, they, they still make these things, the ropes, the chains, um, these things are still available. You know, and another interesting consideration is uh, when you buy replacement windows, they're probably made somewhere else. They might be made in Michigan. So the money that you're spending to buy that window goes to, well, part of it goes to the outlet where you bought it, the lumber yard or window company or whatever that might be. And then the rest of it goes <clears throat> to Michigan or whoever made that window. And oftentimes, materials, if you're doing replacement windows, a lot of times the window itself is going to cost a whole lot more than the cost of putting it in. Okay? <clears throat> if you're having someone repair your windows, that money that you're spending is going more toward labor than it is materials. And the money that you spend to have someone locally fix that window is going to stay low. And they're going to spend it throughout their community. So you're not sending your dollars out to other places. It's, it's helping to support those workers and those other businesses within